and and oh, sorry. Uh, okay <laughs> to uh, to use just for this um, this incident here of, of a required update. So we're going to take another look at the science that we've collected since 2006 and see what the recommendations tell us about uh, implementing those recommendations through land use code options. So this is the directory table of contents from our revised draft summary of best available science that was adopted in 2006. And Linda Leishel from, from the conservation district worked the county at the time and played a very large role in coordinating the, um, the chapters of this document. So uh, Linda, it's, it's held up well, I think, but I think we need to do some updates to it. And okay, those yeah. will likely look more like uh, an appendix to this document with um, abstracts of, of the science documents. Uh, and of course the full documents will be retained in the record. Um, so I think that's the plan at this point, but I haven't actually sat down with our attorneys to determine what's the best route for updating that document. But this is a quick, shot of my directory of some of the information that we've been collecting since 2006. Uh, there's several documents by federal agencies, the EPA and the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, those are largely um, related to obviously endangered species and biological opinions out for uh, Puget Sound. Uh, the state agencies have contributed both, uh, well, DNR Ecology and the Department of Wildlife, uh, their science um, recognized here from them. Uh, and the topics, just a quick overview of them. Uh, there's Samanid science, there's information about the near shore. There's been quite a bit of work lately about kelp and, and uh, protecting um, kelp out in the near shore or in deep water as well. Um, there's been information about bank and shoreline armoring, uh, a big one about pesticides, toxins in stormwater, particularly related to road runoff. Uh, we have a lot of information from Department of Wildlife on riparian functions and on buffer values and site potential tree height, which we talked a little bit about this morning. And then Department of Ecology has also updated their science uh, periodically uh, and fairly minor ways to um, reassess their classification system. And some of that the county is already uh, implementing. So we wanna make sure that our uh, wetland regulations are consistent with the guidelines from the Department of Ecology because we've essentially adopted their science as our science. So this is the range of information that we're looking at right now. And my question to you is, if there is a key scientific document or some research out there that you think has land use recommendations that we can translate into a development code, um, be sure to send that uh, science my way so I can get it into the record and evaluate it for any type of regulatory provisions that uh, would be reflective of what the science is recommending. So that's really kind of the intent today in sharing all of this information about best available science. Uh, we're looking to be as broadly inclusive of the science as we can be. Uh, this is just a sampling of what we've collected so far. I think there's a little bit more in, the, in some subfolders, but this was a, a good example of a, of a showing of what we have in the record at this point. So I'm going to be talking about three examples today. Uh, and showing you what the recommendations from the science are that can be translated potentially into a land use regulation. And I'll be looking at the Department of Wildlife's uh, fairly recent release of volumes one and two of their riparian habitat recommendations. And this is the cover of the document. And the document contains um, information about some ha uh, terrestrial habitat protection requirements, but I want to focus in a little bit here on the mapping tool that they've developed. Uh, this, 
this uh, volume recommends use of site potential tree height at 200 years, uh, which is somewhat going to be a somewhat larger buffer size than what the uh, our science currently tells us. Uh, and the site potential tree height at 200 years uh, is variable depending on the location of the tree stands, um, what tree species it is, what the soil type is, and what the slope and elevation is. Uh, for instance, a Douglas fir on the Washington Ocean coast is going to be a bigger site potential tree height at 200 years than a Doug, the same Douglas fir of the same age uh, in the uh, west foothills of the Cascades. So the Department of Wildlife has um, produced a mapping tool. And the, the pertinent information related to this research and to you know, volume one is, is background and the science. And volume two is the management recommendations, which I jumped straight to for, for the presentation today. But all the information is contained on the Department of Wildlife's website at, at this location here on the uh, on the page. This is not an actual link. So if you download this presentation, you'll need to type that in yourself. So this is an example of a screenshot from that mapping tool. And the, the kind of white, slightly yellow lines are indicative, indicative of the USDA soil polygons. And then the blue is, is the stream corridors. Now, the interesting thing about the soil polygons is their level of accuracy when the USDA put together the data as well as they obviously follow no political boundaries at all, nor would we expect them to. So it can vary from one site to the next uh, what soil polygons are uh, applied uh, and from one stream segment to the next. As you can see in this center uh, river here, the, the more heavy blue line, and uh, you can see that that river flows through a couple of different segments of the, the soil polygons. And I will, the next couple of slides will show you an example of the information available for each of these polygons. And I'm gonna look first at this one over here on the east, mostly east stream side in the next slide. And I captured the scale on one of these pictures. So I wanted to depict it here, but this, this is a 600 foot estimate. So the site potential tree height and the dominant tree species, oops, I changed slides, hang on. Okay, so the dominant tree species in this polygon is a Western hemlock and its site potential tree height at 200 years is 215 feet. So you can see that this soil polygon doesn't really coincide with the ordinary high water mark and so it's, it's not immediately clear what the buffer would look like on this stream, but 215 feet uh, in, let's see if I can do this without changing the slide, in, in this segment up here might apply. Now let's look at the next slide, which will be the next polygon to the west. And this one shows the western hemlock again with a site potential tree height of 224 feet. So that's uh, that's a, what few feet lo uh, larger than the twenty the two hundred fifteen in the in the previous polygon, and then this one over here is a Douglas fir back at two hundred and fifteen feet. So the science is recommending that the largest buffer be applied uh, on on the segment, but we're also going to run into issues where the segments, there's multiple segments on a property and potentially within a development site. So the recommendation is to apply the largest buffer uh, to the stream corridor that would, uh, that the stream that, that's applicable to that site at any location. So it can be a little bit confusing to figure out how to apply this on the ground, uh, particularly if a development site spans several of these soil polygons. So right now we're just collecting the science. We haven't figured out how we might apply it yet for a code provision. 
Um, but one of the requirements that we have under the Growth Management Act is to uh, have our regulations be predictable so that people can fairly easily tell what their buffer requirements would be. And having access to this, this tool will certainly help in that regard. So that's just one example of information that we're uh, looking at right now. Um, another example would be the biological opinion that was prepared by National Marine Fisheries. Uh, this was released a while ago and we have been implementing it. I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in just a moment here. But the basic premise, uh, the reason the biological opinion was prepared was a challenge of FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program in that providing insurance in flood hazard areas actually lowers the risk of catastrophic financial loss and indirectly encourages or supports development in the floodplain. And the floodplain development is therefore seen as disruptive to essential fish habitat. And the species that the Endangered Species Act, uh, this particular consultation and the biop is addressing uh, includes the Puget Sound Chinook Salmon, Puget Sound Steelhead, uh, Hood Canal Summer Run Chum Salmon, which won't be relevant to Snohomish County, uh, and then the Southern Resident Killer Whales as their primary food source is the Chinook Salmon and where the way the Chinook goes seems to be the way the Southern Residents go. Um, the biological opinion contains reasonable and prudent alternatives, RPAs for short, that are designed to avoid, minimize, and mitigate the impacts of the NFIP and prevent a taking of these endangered species. Uh, the RPAs would modify the minimum NFIP criteria, and those criteria are reflected in the county's uh, flood hazard code in uh, Snohomish County Code Chapter 3065. We do implement the NFIP and we try to meet the criteria at a level that will allow uh, floodplain property owners to achieve a lower insurance premium rate because we have protective standards in place that would lower their risk. Um, but we are not a highly rated community in terms of we do not have the lowest rate available of, of flood insurance premiums. Um, and it's questionable where the NFIP is going to end up. They are headed towards getting out of the red, which they've been in for years, and moving their financial situation back into the black. And that potentially and most probably will significantly raise flood insurance rates. So we will be working with FEMA to try to uh, maximize the situation for the benefit of our floodplain residents. So what the RPAs, the reasonable and prudent alternatives require in this biop is you have to choose, the local jurisdictions can choose between option one or two, but you have to pick one of them. And then you have to pick one between option 3A and 3B, and then everyone is subject to option four. Um, so it's, it, you can choose from a, a suite of requirements. And these are difficult to meet. Um, obviously option one, allow no development in the protected area, which I'll show you a map of how they define that here shortly, but it's described as the, um, the union of the floodway channel migration zone plus 50 feet and the riparian buffer zone. Uh, and those are all defined in the, um, in the biological opinion. Terry, can I ask you a question on that one? Yeah. How is development being defined? And I, I'm particularly interested in egg, like heavy use areas. Um, development is being defined as, uh, obviously as buildings, as fill in the floodplain, uh, in, and including flood protection structures. Um, so that sounds like it would be inclusive of a heavy use area for livestock. Um, 
the grazing component of livestock, probably not, but a flood, an elevated flood sanctuary would likely uh, fall under. And there are provisions, they specifically talk about agricultural activities uh, in the model ordinance. Uh, I'll, I'll be mentioning the model ordinance here again in, in a few minutes. Okay. Um, but the other option is to demonstrate, you know, either don't allow the development in, in the protected area, or you demonstrate that any proposed development would not adversely affect water quality, flood volume and velocity, spawning substrate, and floodplain refuge for listed salmonids. Uh, the salmon, when there's a huge flood going through, the salmon tend to head out to the edges of the flood where the water is moving more slowly to, to rest. And sometimes they get stuck out there if there is a depression in the ground and the water recedes before the fish head back to the main channel. So uh, occasionally that can be considered as a take of an endangered species if they get stuck out there. Uh, for option three, um, it's much broader to prohibit development in the full 100-year floodplain of which the protected area is only a portion. Um, and in, or you choose 3B, development within the floodplain but outside of the riparian buffer zone is permitted, uh, then any loss of floodplain storage should be avoided, rectified, or compensated for. Um, and just digging a hole in the floodplain to make your flood storage deeper uh, could potentially um, trip you up into option two with floodplain refuge and um, leaving salmon stranded in the middle of floodplain. So while some people have considered, well, we'll just dig a hole, make it deeper so we can store more flood water, uh, that may not be a good answer in many, if not most cases. Um, any improvements down on option four there, which is a requirement, any improvements or repairs that result in a greater than 10% increase of the structure footprint must mitigate for any adverse effects. Uh, and this is, uh, again, looks back at the compensated storage. So if they're going to increase their footprint, they need to uh, provide compensatory storage. Terry, how does it work if you're doing a setback levy? Um, that's a good question because that does provide a, a greater um, flood way, thereby kind of reducing what might be expected as, as a large flood. So you're, they're essentially reducing the impacts of an existing levy. You're talking about setting one back, uh, removing one and moving it further back away from the ordinary high water mark, correct? That's correct, yeah, and, and yet it still could be within the 100-year floodplain. It, yeah, it would be, but it would not be necessarily a new impact because if you're uh, moving a levee and making the situation technically better in terms of uh, flood dynamics, um, you still have the same amount potentially of flood storage that was lost uh, compared to the original dike location. Yeah, a rebuilt dike could be much bigger than the older one, but it could provide also a lot of storage too, so. Um, right, so the, yeah. the whole, all the water math would have to be figured out essentially. Okay. So this is an example from the a model ordinance that FEMA had, um, they hired some consultants to prepare a model ordinance to implement those requirements in the RPAs that we just walked through. And this is an example of what the protected area looks like when you pile on all three of the components. This blue area up here, if you can't read it, this is the special flood hazard area uh, which is most likely the extent of the 100-year floodplain. And then the dashed line shows the floodway, which is an engineering construct that talks about how much water can be moved uh, without raising the levels downstream more than a foot. 
And so it's, it requires a bit of engineering, Oops, sorry. And it's difficult to do, to determine that. Oh, stop, go back up, there we go. Um, it's difficult to determine that in areas that have been previously diked. So what Snohomish County has worked out with FEMA and FEMA has approved is that in our lower river valleys, we have what we call the density fringe. Not sure where that name came from. This was a long time ago, but we don't have a floodway mapped for the lower Snohomish and the lower Stillaguamish. We rely on this density fringe as a proxy for the floodway. And then in the center, I'm not going to touch my mouse anymore because I seem to have trouble with changing this slide over. Uh, the center there is going to show you the protected area. Let's see, what else are they, they showing there? That's the channel migration zone in, in that center slide. Uh, it may or may not be the same as the 100-year floodplain. Uh, it looks pretty similar except that center portion on the on the um, the right hand side of the waterway is a little bit smaller than the 100 year floodplain but the channel migration zone could potentially actually be bigger than the 100 year floodplain depending on the propensity or ability for avulsions of the river and the erodibility of the soils just outside of the 100 year floodplain. So we could get additional uh, floodplain growth uh, that would be attributed to channel migration. So it's difficult to depict exactly where the channel migration zone is. We have some maps that show us where the rivers are most likely to um, have substantial channel migration, but we don't have the full extent to the channel migration zone mapped for Snohomish County. Uh, we hired some consultants from the UW to prepare that for us. They got about a third of the way done with the study and then the graduate students all got their degrees and left and didn't finish. So we were uh, not able to get the data that we were hoping for from that particular project. Um, the yellow in the upper right corner, that's going to be your riparian habitat zone, uh, which is um, related to buffer widths that are described in, the RP, in a separate RPA, which I didn't capture here for this presentation. But one thing I want to point out is they're including riparian buffer zone on a section of the stream that is outside of the flood uh, special flood hazard area uh, where the national flood insurance program does not apply. And so therefore the biop doesn't apply either. So the area outside of that portion uh, would be subject to uh, potentially any other biological opinions outside of the floodplain or um, other regulations or science such as potentially the, the wildlife PHS uh, information that I just shared with you in example one. Sherry, can I ask you another question? Uh huh. Um, is there going to be any buffer averaging, or do you, or what is it going to be strict width? Um, well, we allow it now. I would suspect that buffer averaging would continue to be allowed where it can make sense. Uh, it typically doesn't occur except in uh, residential subdivisions where uh, lot size is an issue in terms of being able to have lots. Um, yeah, and again, I'm, I'm thinking about agricultural land. Yeah, well, currently there isn't really a buffer requirement in our critical areas code for agricultural lands. It's more related to the farm plans and the uh, best management practices. However, some of those best management practices may be uh, to leave a buffer of some kind. Right. Uh, and, and it likely is somewhere in, in the FOTOG, Field Office Technical Guide. Um, but those buffers would be governed really by those BMPs as opposed to, um, you know, Section 3062A320, where our buffer requirements are. Oh, terrific. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, and that could change up quite a bit if we were to, at, in, at some point in time, opt into the voluntary stewardship program. But of course, that would be a collaborative process. So I would expect that most of the people in this group um, would would be following that particular process if we indeed uh, opt in at some point, uh, should they open that enrollment period again. Okay. So the FEMA has determined that there's a couple of ways to comply with this reasonable and prudent alternative section. Uh, they, we could either adopt FEMA's model ordinance, which we were very reluctant to do because it left a lot of room for interpretation. Um, we weren't entirely happy with the way they were defining things in that ordinance. And it was essentially not as prescriptive as, as we would like. It left a lot of room for interpretation on individual, in individual cases of poor development proposals. And it was, um, was not very consistent with the BMPs for agriculture that we were uh, hoping to take advantage of for critical area protection. So another option, we kind of checked that one off the list for the model ordinance. Um, the other options to demonstrate through the checklist approach that existing ordinances adequately protect the species. So uh, FEMA put together a checklist and what we were um, uh, allowed to do is put our regulations side by side with each, each of the components in the checklist to show that we had coverage and equivalent protection for each of the, um, the checklisted items. We submitted a checklist and we don't know what ever happened to it. It was a long time ago. It contained all kinds of hyperlinks to the code so that the provisions we were highlighting could be read in context with the code. Um, FEMA really liked the approach we, we took, but they had no idea what to do with it in terms of whether or not what we said uh, was a comparative and equivalent provision. Um, they didn't have a way to evaluate that, and we never heard back from them on that. Uh, the other option was to adopt a combination of the model ordinance and our own existing regulations. So essentially it's a checklist exercise again to show where our regulations may not meet the same standard as the model ordinance and then uh, amend them so that uh, we would have full coverage under, uh, under their model ordinance. Um, the other option would be is to show compliance with the Endangered Species Act on a permit by permit basis, or to prohibit all development in the floodplain, which was a, a very unlikely um, direction for the county to take. So what we do currently, we show compliance with the Endangered Species Act on a permit by permit basis by requiring a habitat management plan to show how the development is going to avoid, minimize, or mitigate any impacts to the endangered species. Um, this has been somewhat of a burden for our uh, project proponents uh, and also for our staff. And we're hoping that we can potentially find a better solution through the critical area update in, in this cycle. Uh, we'll see how that goes. We do not have anything proposed as an alternative at this point, but uh, we will definitely be looking at it uh, between uh, the permitting staff who regularly has to deal with these flood hazard permits and the habitat management plans and with code writing staff. So I will have a permitting staff member on, on the team when we're addressing this particular or attempting to address this particular issue. There, habitat management plants. Yep, that's how we do it. Okay, and a third example of the science is a kind of somewhat recent analysis that shows that the coho salmon spawning mortality is directly and strongly related to 
stormwater runoff from roads. Um, this is a, a listing, uh, the title and the listing of the authors of this particular science. And then there's a jump here to the findings from that study that the freshwater migration of coho coincides with seasonal rainfall, which is nothing new for anyone who's familiar with how salmon, what triggers salmon to move upstream. Um, but that seasonal rainfall increase also triggers a, a substantial increase in stormwater runoff, uh, particularly in the urban watersheds where there's substantial impervious surface. And the field assessments in the urban stream networks have shown that there is a greater than 50% spawner mortality rate. So the fish are dying at a really high rate in urban streams. Uh, they tested um, highway runoff was collected and they tested uh, untreated runoff and uh, some infiltration treatment for non-polluted runoff and the uh, mortality was, was close to 100% for the untreated runoff from highways. <clears throat> and this mortality syndrome that they were observing uh, was pretty quick. It didn't take long for the fish to die once exposed to the highway runoff. And that this mortality syndrome was nearly 100% prevented when the highway runoff was pre-treated with some sort of a bioinfiltration process, um, which is pretty common uh, in terms of our low impact development requirements for um, and part of our green stormwater infrastructure requirements under our Clean Water Act. So this is a distinct crossover between our critical area regulations and our stormwater requirements. So we took a look a little bit at what biofiltration options might be available or considered to be the best. So we have some information gathered here and I don't know that there is um, much of a performance difference, just so long as there is enough biofiltration in terms of you know, enough soil filtration. Um, and when that is combined with street sweeping to, uh, to try to minimize the amount of pollutants going down that storm drain. Um, that will significantly improve the water quality of the stormwater runoff before it reaches uh, any water body that might contain fish. Um, the trick, of course, the trickier situations are where the road network runs very close to the stream itself and, and trying to keep the stormwater out of you know, direct flow out of um, from the road directly into the stream, but instead to send it through some sort of bioinfiltration um, structure before it can reach the stream is obviously more complicated the closer the road is to the stream. But we do have requirements in our uh, EDS. It's the engineering de development and design standards for roads and they are required to use bioinfiltration uh, or other LID techniques whenever it is available to be used. Um, if, if you're going through clay soils, uh, you may not be able to get as high a quality of a bioinfiltration system set up. So in some cases, it's not feasible but I think in many cases it is. And a lot of the road developments that are going in now by the county uh, require the use of, of some sort of bioinfiltration or bioswale to uh, filter the stormwater runoff. Great, um, can I ask you a question about this one? Yeah. Do you know, uh, so these look like they would be primarily in county right-of-way areas. Um, is the county going to maintain these? Typically, yes. Okay. Um, it depends on where they are. If it's an, an easement, uh, easement given to the county or awarded to the county over private property, there will likely be some language in the easement as to who has management and maintenance responsibility for these. 
Okay. Um, yeah, but the county does keep an inventory of them. And uh, as part of our inspection and maintenance program in that's managed out of surface water management. Okay, thank you. Not Zoom. Here we go, get on the right page here. Okay, and then this I thought you might find interesting uh, from the agricultural interest side, but this was um, taken from a report uh, that uh, was on the news and the author is up there listed Bellamy Palethorpe. She is um, oh, NPR, National Public Radio uh, reporter, <clears throat> environmental reporter for the Northwest. And there was a lawsuit um, between Northwest Environmental Advocates and the State Department of Ecology. And the case brought together the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act, uh, and a settlement agreement was signed in uh, January of 2021. So Ecology has some work that they will be doing. Uh, hopefully they are uh, already um, beginning to work on this. Hopefully they've had some time. <clears throat> Excuse me, but ecology is going to be required to complete guidance to farmers on actions that are necessary to protect water quality. Uh, ecology is required to identify the width of streamside buffers that are needed on farmland to protect cold water needed by salmon. Um, ecology is required to specify the farm practices that are needed to meet water pollution cleanup plans and to identify uh, where it is taking actions to control polluted runoff and report those actions to the EPA. And then the EPA has some additional actions to review a Washington statewide non-point pollution plan and to submit its proposed approval of Washington's non-point plan to expert federal fish and wildlife agencies to assess its impact on threatened and endangered species. Um, this could lead to some significant changes in our current strategy to use field office technical guide BMPs to protect critical areas uh, related to farming activities. Um, we have not seen anything from ecology yet on, uh, on their work under this settlement agreement, but, uh, and I don't know exactly what kind of a deadline they might be on for this, uh, but this could be um, an, an interesting wrinkle in looking at science related to our critical area regulations as they relate to agricultural activities and farmland. So I wanted to just kind of wave this flag a little bit to say that um, the state has uh, some mandated work that they're doing the, in coordination with the uh, federal agencies. So this could result in uh, something that we would likely have to address in, in a critical areas requirement or in a uh, voluntary stewardship program uh, should that uh, option arise. And this is the schedule as it sits right now for proceeding with this critical areas update. Uh, I've been gathering and reviewing the post 2006 best available science and that's what's my kind of my slated target for this year. Uh, and to prepare a summary of the information and the recommendations that are coming out of the science since our 2006 document was published. Um, there'll be public process, which, of course, this is part of. And there will be additional outreach to Ag Board and to uh, interested um, stakeholders this year. And then, of course, we've got um, the drafting process for the code and attorney review. And then the adoption process will also afford additional uh, public involvement, availability, comment periods. <clears throat> but we're hoping to have uh, a code addressed by council um, by the end of the second quarter of 2024, um, because um, 
that is our deadline for our growth management updates it would be June 30th of 2024. Actually, no, that's been extended out to December of 2024. So we want to get the critical areas adopted and and taken care of so that council can focus on the land use alternatives for the larger comp plan update that was, that's going on at the same time. Um, but this does give us a little bit of room if we need to extend the public involvement process or the code revision process. Uh, so we have a little bit of wiggle room in the schedule, but I would like to stick to it as closely as possible so that council is available to address these issues without the uh, much larger, uh, essentially distraction of the, of the general policy plan and the land use maps. And that is my last slide. I'll just leave this up in case people have questions about the schedule, but I think that was it. So if there's any questions, um, we're, we're ready to take a look at those now. That was outstanding, Terry. Um, I really hope a lot more people see this because uh, this was um, every bit as important, if not more so, than your talk this morning. So I agree. You. That was an awesome presentation. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, this this is a, the you know kind of the sign of things to come and what we're going to be evaluating in terms of making any changes. And, and I do want to add too that I, I mentioned this morning that there are some changes that you know our permitting staff want to see to this code as well to improve clarity and, and improve, improve process. So we'll be looking at some of those changes as well. And um, our uh, environmental reviewers and environmental planners have been keeping a list for me. So that's extremely helpful. It seems some of that work that ecology is doing right now is pretty relevant to um, where you're going. Uh, I know the work we're doing in Skagit counties right now is kind of weighing different alternatives of what's acceptable to the public around um, buffer widths. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where that goes, as well as the oversight on that non-point source plan. Um, that's a part of my past history that I worked on until uh, about 2001. So uh, a draft of that. So um, that, that could have uh, big impacts all across the state. Well, if anybody is aware of additional science documents that you think are key components and should be uh, rolled into uh, regulatory requirements, um, please send them my way. I'm in the collection process as we speak. And um, you know, once I start writing the code, it's a lot more difficult to roll in additional science. It's not impossible, but uh, the whole code needs to work together. So it's, it's trickier to roll something in later as opposed to try to get a handle on it in advance. Terry, do you have the studies that um, have been done by the UW Climate Impacts Group in the floodplain? Um, we are working on a climate change element to our comprehensive plan. Uh, and I have seen some of the sea level rise data, but I have not seen a lot more studies out of the, uh, out of the UW. Now, if you have something that you think I need to take a look at, definitely send it my way. Okay, I will. Thanks. Hey, Terry, this is a CK item from uh, Ducks Unlimited, also the SLS. Um, we have a lot of projects that kind of don't exactly fit either into farmland work or wetlands. Um, they, they tend to be using farm practices to enhance wetland function um, and then sometimes switch back into farmland. So we prefer them to be regulated as farmlands, but it seems every county handles that differently. And we've been having pretty good success in Snohomish County permitting that kind of stuff. But that 
seems to be really up to staff interpretation. Would there be an opportunity to sit down specifically with you and talk about some of the projects we do and see how they fit into critical areas and and uh, provide any best available science you might need? Um, yes, we could certainly um, you know set set something up. I would like to include in any meetings like that our um, environmental planners who would be reviewing them mm -hmm. uh, just to make certain because I don't review permits so yeah. I'm really not on the implementation end of, of these codes very much um, unless someone asks me what I meant by something I wrote <laughs> um, so I would want to include somebody from Sean Curran's group perhaps Sean himself to to walk through uh, any kind of um, you know, permitting type project review type questions, but yeah, we could certainly do that. Okay. And I guess another related question, is there any, I missed the first part of this, I was on another call. Is there any um, provisions going to be written into the code as far as maintenance or um, updating uh, critical areas that have been, been set aside or restored, but um, that are now older and have have lots of invasive vegetation or um, are just not being taken care of very well? Because that's that's a issue I can imagine might be coming up after 20 years of critical area areas being set aside. Right. Um, we don't currently have anything like that in the code, as you're probably aware. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, maintenance of restored areas and to ensure that they're continuing their functions and values um, could essentially roll into you know, like monitoring requirements, which we do have. Um, but possibly there could be some you know specific language included in the code to, to talk about um, maintenance of restored areas and 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 whose responsibilities and and uh, what kind of maintenance and and when that maintenance could occur based on you know the specifics of the the critical area etc. So potentially yes, but we don't have anything currently in there like that. Yeah, it, it feels like that's something like a, a detention pond that's you know owned by a homeowners group. You know, a critical area um, owned by a homeowners group. They don't really have resources or the inclination to, to maintain those areas. Um, right, and, and in terms of need. some of the, the storm, if it's a stormwater facility, um, the management requirements and the maintenance requirements are usually written into the, um, the subdivision, they're usually in subdivisions or if it's a commercial permit, uh, those maintenance requirements are usually written in to the easement language for the location of that. Sometimes the county is responsible for the maintenance on those and sometimes the private property holders, uh, the HOAs, et cetera, are responsible for the maintenance. And the problem with HOAs is they, um, they often, not always, but often disappear. Um, and so the, the maintenance doesn't get done, properties get sold, people don't realize what the responsibilities are uh, etc. But the county has an inspection process and an inspection division specifically for um, maintenance of, of stormwater facilities to make sure that in the urban area to make sure that they're still functioning. So as long as it's a stormwater facility, we may have uh, already got some leverage on maintenance in our stormwater requirements in chapters 3063A and B. Yeah, and it feels like, I don't know if that exists for critical areas, but it feels like that would need to be there for those as well. And uh, Right, if we have a wetland, yeah, if we have a wetland being used as a stormwater facility, then that would be included in the maintenance requirements in our stormwater code. But you're right, there is nothing similar for, for just straight up function of, of uh, critical areas or um, restoration sites. Well, thank you. Terry, I put a link in for uh, the Washington Stormwater Center at WSU runs out of Puyallup and uh, they've got tons of stuff on 
um, managing stormwater from roads and different technologies and media, all that kind of stuff is being researched there. Yes, they, they do maintain a lot of information and Department of Ecology has a stormwater manual, which also includes a significant amount of information on um, maintenance of all the different types of stormwater facilities and Snohomish County has an equivalent manual. So we have quite a bit of information uh, available as well. Good. Any other questions or recommendations for Terry? Great. Well, Terry, thank you again for both of your presentations today. Um, and thank you everybody else for joining us. We will post the recordings to farmfishflood.org soon. So feel free to review them there or send them along to anybody else. Uh, David, did you want to say something? You're muted. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify for for everybody. Right now, it sounds like Terry, you're in the in the collection phase of of technical information, um, and then you'll be uh, doing some drafting. It uh, looks like uh, towards late, latter part of the year. Um, is there um, any? How would you like to engage around the drafting side of it? Would you like to put something out first and have us look at it? Or would you prefer to have some specific ideas added before you start putting pen to paper? Well, if anybody has some you know, larger concept type issues they want to see addressed, like what CK brought up about the maintenance of restoration sites, or, or just simply the maintenance of protected critical areas to keep invasive species out, things like that. If there is um, you know, some comments you'd like to make along those lines uh, before I start writing, that would be great to hear as well. But uh, it might be easier for most folks to respond to something that's been written where the changes are you know, highlighted in you know, strike through and underline type of, um, type of formatting. Uh, it's often easier to respond to something than it is to you know, try to come up with ideas um, beforehand. But if anybody has ideas, uh, and a lot of people you know, on this, you know, in the audience here today uh, has had a lot of experience with uh, critical area requirements and has also um, got, I'm sure there's some folks here that have some opinions on the county's current critical area regulations um, in terms of their ability to uh, protect critical area functions and values as well as specific requirements that we have in the code. So if there's any comments ahead of drafting, send them my way. If you prefer to wait until there's something drafted and want to respond to comments, then uh, that can work as well. Thanks so much, Terry. Appreciate it. Great job. Sarah. That's it for me. Great. Well, we'll close out the presentation today then. Thank you again, everybody, for attending, and I will see you soon. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you.